easy guys, in this video I attempt the genocidal herbivore challenge in Spore. There's no doubt that vegetarians can claim moral superiority over carnivores, but just how superior are they? To find out, I turn to everyone's favourite evolution simulator, the 2008 classic Spore. The rules for the genocidal herbivore challenge, stipulated by Reddit, were simple. My character had to be a herbivore. He could only eat fruit and vegetables, with a disturbing desire to stab and kill anything that moved. How challenging could this be? Herbivores in Spore deal less bite damage than carnivores, and have no way to eat the bodies of their enemies to regain strength during a fight, but would this stop me? There was only one way to find out. It all started in the tide pool, after our planet had been seeded with life by a mysterious pitiful worm with godlike powers and a staff of life. I began the cell stage with a new vegetarian hero, Pete. His name, an acronym, for people for the ethical termination of everybody. His journey began, to hand out justice to all heretics who harmed other creatures and the planet they lived on. And just about anyone else he didn't like. Here lay our first problem. Our vegetarian mouthparts left us unable to attack the other organisms who defied our strict moral code. The solution? Defensive spikes. Defense would truly be the best offense. Terribly cliche, I know. Folklore tells us that it's the motion in the ocean that counts. But it's wrong. Bigger is always better. It's crucial that you can poke someone before they can poke you. With the biggest spike possible on his backside, Pete didn't even have to move. Most carnivores just threw themselves against it. Unfortunately, with only one spike at his disposal, the carnivorous heretics would often find a hole in his defenses. Pete's solution? More spikes. Wrapping his body almost 360 degrees, he was virtually impenetrable. Even the bigger heretics found him difficult to deal with, falling afoul of his plethora of barbs. Strong though Pete was, he struggled to claim his spoils of victory. He had been so consumed with cleansing heretics with his bristles of mass destruction that he had made little effort to enhance his speed or maneuverability. He was a pong ball of the ocean, going wherever he was pushed or where the tide was strongest, causing any poor creature he was pressed against to spontaneously burst. To improve this, he needed some better fins, or a water jet, which meant killing a creature that already had them. But all he could find was this absolute unit. He threw himself into the attack, despite this being one of the strongest cretins in the tide pool. He parried its huge jaws. He had just enough speed to roll into its eye. After the deed was done, some struggling commenced as Pete attempted to seize his prize. At last, he had a jet. Finally, he had the speed he desired, launching himself at his enemies with devastating results. Pete had become a flying spear, a nail bomb of the tide pool, but the horrors these other organisms had committed against their environment, stripping its forest bare and attacking defenseless organisms, demanded the toughest of heroes. If this continued, these heretics would inevitably use up the planet's supply of resources, and all would perish. The hardest choices required the strongest of wills. But if he was to save his planet, he needed to leave the ocean and step out onto land. To his surprise, Pete found a pair of legs under his belly. He beckoned to his fellow kind and scrambled to shore. The same tactics that had served him in the tide pool served him faithfully above water. He charged with incredible speed and used his spikes to impale his enemies. But he lacked raw damage. If he was to prevail in his mission to cleanse the planet of heretics, he needed more to join his cause. After saving the beach from ecological disaster, his species evolved, becoming even more sentient. What would our vegetarians do with this increased realization, perception, or knowledge, you ask? More stabbing, the spiked tail that defended him from behind now took on an offensive role at the front. His mouth parts grew to maximize damage, forcing his eyes to protrude from his head. Pete was here to eat leaves and cause damage, and he was all out of leaves. After evolving, he recruited a fellow member of his species, Greta, to join him on the path of activism. As the pair romped through the countryside, destroying any nest they found, Greta wondered if Pete was misguided. Pete destroyed everything in sight, but what if innocent species like fellow vegetarians were caught up in the slaughter? Pete dismissed this nonsense. A true activist would tell them their beliefs within two minutes of meeting them. The loss of innocence would never be an issue. As time passed, more vegetarians joined Pete and Greta, avoiding ecological disasters and saving the planet one species at a time. 
While their bites were weak, their powerful charge and strike abilities were enough to slaughter to bring justice to those with different beliefs. One day, things took a turn for the worse. Suddenly outnumbered, Pete was knocked into a coma. While Pete was gravely ill, many thought he might pass on to the afterleaf. But he clung on, his efforts had granted his species success. The genocidal herbivores were one of the greatest predators of their age, despite not eating an ounce of meat. He had become a hero amongst his people. While Pete was in medical care, it was up to Greta to lead the genocidal herbivores into the tribal age, and she had big plans. Their species needed to reduce their environmental impact, and so they became shepherds of other wild species. Only three creatures would be domesticated. Any more than this and the increased amount of farts they produced might encourage global warming. Greta performed many rousing protests against the other species, warning them of how her dreams and her childhood had been stolen. Entire ecosystems had been collapsing while they had all been discussing money and fairy tales of economic growth. How dare they? She was a viral sensation, causing everyone to like and subscribe to vegetarian beliefs. Greta had become the greatest activist of her time. Meanwhile, back in their home village, the only food their species ate was eggs from their domesticated animals. And while some species, including some tribal rhubarb, disagreed with Greta, wanting to enjoy beef burgers and bacon, they were soon silenced, all while Pete lay in his million-year slumber. It wasn't long before Greta had made peace with all the other species, undoing much of Pete's hard work. As their species advanced into the civilization age, a period of peace ensued. However, with their dominance established, rival factions emerged, each with its own vision for the future of the genocidal herbivore species. Greta initially sought control of the planet's vital spice veins, the key to their species' wealth. She then converted rival cities through protest, citing how irresponsible they had all been, and how her childhood had been stolen in the tide pool by Jeff Bezos. This subdued them for a while. Rumors of powerful factions arose, including the Reds to the East and the Greens to the West. Greta's religious, economically responsible Teslas clashed with the militaristic Reds. And over time, as she grew into an adolescent, the power of her protests waned. Meanwhile, in the medical city, Peter woke from his 500 million year coma. He found a vastly different world to the one he remembered. He tried to eat some fruit from a bush, but accidentally swallowed an iPhone. After consuming the poisoned apple, he slowly realized that their faction lacked any real military. Greta's focus on religious Teslas left them vulnerable to the Reds' naval attacks, which were sailing around the continent and attacking the capital. To make matters worse, the Greens were now sending squadrons of newly developed fighter planes to attack vegetarian cities. Facing attacks from both sides, Pete took advantage of the chaos. He vowed to his people to reclaim their crumbling capital and put their waning faction back on the map. He did so with a new vehicle designed only for conquest. After a short military coup, Greta submitted. Pete had led a successful campaign against the Reds, smashing their remaining cities with constant bombardments. His new tanks had done well before turning his sights to the Greens, regaining their vegetarian capital city, Genocidal Prime. Pete ordered new military planes to cross the ocean and with a new air force, destroyed the remaining green cities. The genocidal herbivores teetered on the brink of extinction due to their softness, but had swiftly risen to greatness. Pete's return sparked fear, leading the greens to submit. Greta acknowledged her error and embraced force over words in the war to come. Pete and Greta's people became space-age zealots, spreading activism and vegetarian beliefs and those who opposed them would kneel. As the vegetarians moved into space, Pete discovered many ethically inferior civilizations that ate meat and kept their opinions to themselves. Their futures would all soon be sealed. Due to their turbulent history of peace and genocide, Spore had granted our vegetarians with an obscene zealot ability, fanatical frenzy, an ability that would convert an entire planet over to the one true way, vegetarian handing over every city on the planet over to us. You would think such a powerful weapon in Spore would be quite costly, similar to the Planet Buster. Actually, it was free to use, with only a half hour cooldown, which reset itself anyway if you saved and reloaded the game. Ah, Spore. Why waste time in the early game terraforming planets, building colonies and selling spice when you could simply take a rival civilization's home world, which were often tier 3 planets with all the trimmings? then sell their spice instead. 
The downside of Fanatical Frenzy was it broke the Galactic Code, and so all the neighboring planets declared war on him, although they would all be vegetarians in 30 minutes or so, so what did it matter anyway? They had also unwillingly announced the location of their home worlds, making our job easier. Slowly but surely, each planet was systematically converted. Entire species were wiped out with the power of Fanatical Frenzy at hand. The genocidal herbivores had claimed every planet they encountered. However, like every species in Spore, Pete longed to venture to the galaxy's center, spreading the power of a vegetable-based diet along the way. It was a long and tedious path, converting all he encountered, until he met a curious new race called the Grox, who seemed to enjoy Pete's acts of genocide. Although they weren't very talkative, a clear sign of guilt, and so Pete spread the love of vegetables once more. The Grox had many, many planets, and the center of the galaxy was infested with them. While the Grox were passive at first, they soon realized there were never many vegetarian options in restaurants, and they missed bacon, eventually objecting to Pete's presence. But Pete was too strong. There should always be more vegetarian options, like house cleaning, dealing with a stubborn bathroom stain. Pete made it his mission to cleanse the galaxy's center of this heresy. Many years passed, each etching deeper lines of solitude upon Pete's weary face. Finally, his work was done. While much of the galaxy remained untamed, he had left his mark, a testament to his unwavering beliefs. As he journeyed towards the galaxy's heart to claim his reward, he pondered the irony. The cost of his allegiance to his vegetarian beliefs had been steep, leaving him devoid of friends or allies. Yet amidst his cosmic sovereignty, he grappled with the paradox of his conquest. In pursuing purity, he had become a harbinger of chaos presiding over a realm marred by constant ego disasters. Alone, amidst the chaos, he questioned the true nature of his victory. A bittersweet triumph, stained by the realization that in cleansing the galaxy, he had become its scourge. Standing at the threshold of his coveted reward, he wondered if the price of his beliefs had been worth the cost of his humanity.